Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see uh, so many of you here today. Um, hopefully, this will be a session that will um, really inspire you uh, in constructing your portfolios. So, in kicking off the presentation today, I'd like to talk about three facts uh, in the marketplace. And these three facts I became aware of as I started investigating into the private equity markets. And uh, I think these three facts, uh, they certainly for me, they change the way I view investment markets uh, totally. And hopefully they do the same for you. So the first fact out there is that if you look at all companies in the US and European markets with revenues in excess of $10 million, so real investable companies, the percentage of those companies that are listed is only 2%. So if you as investors are only investing in listed companies, you are effectively ignoring 98% of the opportunities in the world. Interesting statistic. The second statistic, which is much more interesting than that, and this statistic is as follows. If you looked at the US market in the year 2000, there were approximately 9,000 listed companies. Today, 19 years later, there are only approximately 4,000 listed companies. The listed world is shrinking at a dramatic rate. And why is this happening? The reason for this is that if you're in uh, the US market, it's too costly and complex to be listed. You have to do quarterly reporting. It's a huge ask. You have, to, um, you have to have this gigantic compliance infrastructure. You have to have legal costs, insurance costs, et cetera, et cetera. It does not make sense to be a listed company unless you are maybe north of $2 billion in market cap. So if you're one or $2 billion market capitalization company, you do not want to be listed. This is a strange concept for us in Australia because when you look at the ASX, most of our market is indeed in that range. That's the mainstay of our marketplace. But in the US market, that, that uh, space is uh, disappearing rapidly. And so what's happened is that these companies um, who were once upon a time maybe listed have been either taken private or delisted, or companies which a couple of decades ago at a size of one or two billion dollars that would have listed, they've stayed private. And so most of this world is actually in private hands now. You cannot access this world through listed investments. These companies, whilst they might be private, they still have capital requirements. They still need to buy, they still need to uh, change their shareholder bases, uh, they still need to expand their businesses, they still need capital. And where have they gone for capital? They've gone to the private equity world. So private equity firms, which are firms which raise money in order to invest in private companies, these, these firms have expanded at a rapid rate. And in the year 2000, there was approximately $500 billion, $500 billion invested in global private equity. Today, that number has grown by in excess of six times. It's approaching $3.5 trillion invested into private equity. Now, that's a lot of money that's gone into private equity. It's a big part of the world. Yet the demand for capital in the private market still vastly exceeds the supply of capital. Certainly the demand for capital um, in general across, across those full range of companies. When we looked at the space uh, from a Pingana perspective, we saw a massive opportunity here. Our investors want to be invested in private equity. Now, the, if you look at the top end of the market, the very sophisticated large end of the investment markets, the, uh, th that group of investors have lots of private equity in their portfolios. In fact, in Australia even, if you look at the future fund, which is arguably the most sophisticated of the large institutions in Australia, the future fund today has close to 16% of their portfolio in private equity. But our high net worth retail super self-managed super investors, by and large, they don't have any access to this private equity. And we want to bring this access to private equity to our investors. We are, we are in a position today to bring this access to our investors, and this is through the Pengana um, Private Equity Trust. 
a trust that will be listed on the ASX and will give all of our investors an opportunity to access high quality global private equity. You can see um, by the list uh, on, the, on the slide um, of um, our syndicate uh, who's involved in helping us raise the capital. I think I've met most of you in the audience. My name is Russell Pillimer. I'm the CEO of Pengana Capital. Just a bit of a recap about Pengana Capital. Pengana Capital is a publicly listed funds management group. Uh, we uh, today run about $3.2 billion uh, of funds under management. We offer various strategies across international equities, Australian equities, uh, small caps, large, clap, large caps, ethical investing, um, et cetera. We are constantly on the lookout for opportunities that make sense for our clients. Our client base is all individual clients. We don't deal with big institutions. We like to keep our, our, our funds of a manageable size so we can continue to generate superior um, outperformance over long periods of time. Private equity makes a lot of sense for our investors. By and large, what we are trying to do for our investors in each of our products is to generate good long-term returns with lower levels, of risk, lower levels of risk. When we looked at the private equity market and thought about designing a product, we saw that this pro product could fit very, very well into this paradigm. So why private equity? What is so special about private equity? I mentioned the broader investment universe. There are a lot of investment opportunities available in private equity, much more than in listed equities. Portfolio diversification. Private equity in your portfolio will behave differently to listed equities. It has what we call low levels of correlation with listed equities. It makes sense to help you balance your portfolios and to give you a buffer to your portfolios in volatile equity markets. It's resilient. Uh, uh, when you see, historically, when you've seen large falls in, in public equity markets, in listed equities, private equity has moved much more slowly. It's m been much more resilient than listed equities. And finally, if you look at the returns of, pri of private equity relative to listed equities, in general, there's been a significant premium that you can generate by investing in private equity. So in order, to put, in order to manage a product in private equity space, you need to have access to the best private equity funds. The best private equity funds in the marketplace usually do not want your money. There are very few firms who dominate the space, and one of these firms is Grosvenor Capital. Now, we went around and met with uh, several um, uh, com competitors of Grosvenor globally. Um, in order to assess who could best manage the product for us and our investors. Grosvenor is the standout performer. Um, you will soon hear from a um, Aris Hatch, who's a managing director at Grosvenor Capital, uh, about Grosvenor, but just thought I'd mention a couple of the reasons why we as Pengana um, selected Grosvenor. So Grosvenor is a large business. Uh, they, operate, they manage about $52 billion uh, in um, alternative assets, about half of that is in private equity. So big play in the market. They have got very deep relationships with what we call um, middle-sized private equity managers. Private equity managers who don't manage tens of billions of dollars, but are not too small as well. Uh, uh, Grosvenor's ideal space is managers in the range of half a billion dollars to one and a half billion dollars. That's where they focus. That is the part of the market where that has the best risk and return relationships um, that we've identified in the marketplace. The average companies that the Grosvenor uh, funds that, that Grosvenor invests in, um, uh, the average size of those companies is about a billion dollars. So we're looking at robust companies. We're not looking at, this is not venture capital, highly risky investments. This is, these are robust companies. We also wanted to put together a portfolio that had lots of investments in it. Diversification is a key in the marketplace. Grosvenor have substantial, numerous relationships in the marketplace, and they were able to build such a product uh, for us. Grosvenor only has, uh, they focus on the institutional market, they only have institutional clients, and our trust that we will be putting together looks like another one of the institutional clients that Grosvenor has. 
Grosvenor has a fantastic track record dating back a couple of decades, and it's this track record that we identified as being uh, of paramount importance to us. I'm now going to hand over to Aris Hatch, who will come and talk a little bit um, about the portfolio and about investing in private equity. Um, I will return after Aris has uh, finished uh, speaking and talk specifically about the trust, the attributes of the trust, and how it works in a listed context. Over to you, Aris. Good afternoon. This is a great turnout for a bunch of people in Sydney to hear about private equity. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Um, as Russell mentioned, my name is Aris Hatch. I'm a managing director with GCM Grosvenor. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about this offering that we've created for the marketplace with Pangana. It's something that we believe is very unique in the marketplace. It solves for a lot of risks and challenges for the average retail investor to access an area of the market that heretofore has not been structurally accessible for a lot of different reasons. And I'll take you through those. Over the next few minutes, what I'm going to do is tell you about six facts who anybody who's thinking about investing in private equity should be thinking about and be aware of. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the building blocks that go into making a private equity program, like the program we're talking about today. And then lastly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how GCM Grosvenor does that. So you can get a sense of exactly what we're intending to do with this offering and exactly what you would get as a potential investor. So let's start off with what is private equity, right? It has a lot of different connotations, negative, positive, large, small, venture, big buyout. Well, we think of private equity in these three buckets, and these are actually the three buckets that would be represented in the solution we're discussing today. The first is the buyout company. It's a larger company that has revenues, and managers come, they purchase them in a private environment, they apply some leverage. These are sometimes called LBOs, or leverage buyouts. They grow them, they foster them, and then they ultimately sell them in an exit. Special situations are basically distressed assets that you purchase for control. And then growth equity is not venture capital. And I want to make that clear. We don't actually think venture capital is an asset class anymore. It's more like a group of funds that perform extremely well, and you're either in them or you're not. And if you're not, the, the performance between a median and a top quartile manager is tremendous, even more so than what you'll see in a moment. Growth equity is the space where those early stage companies, not just your social media darlings and your tech companies, they've grown up more. They have revenues, proven business models, customers, referenceable partners and you can apply additional funding with them for growth to take them to the next level. Some of the risk has been mitigated out of their business models. So what do private equity managers do in this space once you give them your money? You've entrusted them with your capital. What's happening to it? It's not just a black box. You can get a sense here of some of the activities, the levers that a private equity manager can use in a private environment. Many of these companies that we pursue, particularly in the mid-marketplace, they're orphaned assets from next generation family owners. We see very successful businesses that parents, grandparents have built over the years, and the next generation just doesn't want to continue that business. Those are wonderful opportunities for private equity managers to come in, purchase the assets or a portion of the assets and buy out the family owner and do something with that legacy. Combine it with another company if make it more efficient with some technology, hire new talent, expand the product offering, expand the geographic footprint. There's a lot of options. They also take restructuring into consideration. Managers increase working capital, so you can do more with the company over time. And they even create and develop new product offerings, many of which you can encounter. Russ mentioned that there's 98% of the universe that you are ignoring if you're only in public equities. This probably drives it home a little bit more. Your public equities portfolio is quite literally the tip of the iceberg. Now, to be clear, all of those other companies down below do not necessarily warrant capital, aren't necessarily going to be great investments. But the fact is you don't even have the optionality of participating in them if you're not in private equity. 
And that tip of the iceberg is melting. In the states alone, 50% decline since 96 in listed companies, almost 30% in Europe. And Russ mentioned already some of the dynamics as to why the expense associated with it. Companies that can't be in the public eye to do what they have to do, the regulatory complexities, the tax burdens, the disclosure burdens, the compliance burdens. In the mid-market, specifically where we like to focus and invest, it can't even be an option for companies to list. It's simply too expensive. So where's the money coming from? Well, you heard there's a six times increase in AUM in private equity. That's a big number. And it's coming from global institutions. Some of the world's most preeminent pension plans, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, universities, corporations, financial institutions, healthcare providers. The appetite has become ravenous. And it is because these pensions, these investors that are institutional, are not able to meet their actuarial rate of return, their liability fundings for their pensioners, and their obligations just with public equity performance alone. They need alpha. But private equity is patient capital, and it's an institution of that size that can weather the long-term illiquidity and stomach that illiquidity, not the retail investor. What about right here at home? Future fund has good exposure. Your superannuation is only 4%. So why? why? Why all this pummeling of capital into this space? Take a look. We talked about long-term value creation. We talked about market cycle resiliency and that this is an illiquid asset class. Here what you're seeing is across the world, US, Europe, and Asia, the performance of private equity in the top blue bars relative to public market indices in those regions. In other words, if you had bought and sold the index at the same time that you would have contributed capital and gotten capital back from private equity, this is the difference in what the performance would have been. What about down markets? What happened in the global financial crisis? We get asked that a lot, and that's a very fair question. Take a look at private equity before, during, and after the global financial crisis. And relative to public markets, again, the MSCI world, the AC world. What you're seeing here in the dark blue bar is that private equity performance not only held its sustainable outperformance pre-crisis, it was more resilient during the crisis and outperformed post-crisis. So why is that? The assets that are underpinning this performance are private. Private equity is private. They were not subject to the swings of the market. The valuations did not change. They weren't in the spotlight. They weren't trying to beat the street. Managers during a crisis environment are able to retrench, work on the companies, make them more efficient, add capital, not worry about a stock price or stockholders, or people pulling capital out, and actually add better talent on the cheap frequently. I always say that a good private equity manager loves a good recession. The best private equity funds over two decades have been formed during a down market. Now that's not only because of the levers I mentioned that a manager can pull to help a company grow, it's because when you're even putting money to work during a recession, you're buying those companies off of trough earnings, as cheap as they come, and you're selling them out of that market when the market is heating up and multiples are heating up. And that is the benefit that clients get in macroeconomic headwinds like a recessionary environment. So how much is, is right, right? If you look at your portfolio, call it a traditional 60-40, 60% equities, 40% bonds or fixed income. If you were to add just 20% exposure to private equity, this shows you exactly the kind of performance lift that you would get without adding volatility or risk. We think that's worthwhile to try to figure out exactly how to deliver for a retail client. So let's do a quick recap, right? We got those six key facts down. Public companies, your public equities portfolio, tip of the iceberg, whole universe down below. And that universe is growing and the tip of the iceberg is declining. The money keeps going in. There's no sign of it stopping. 
Here at home, you've got very minimal exposure, very limited access. The returns seem quite attractive across multiple cycles, ups, downs, multiple geographies as well. And there's the potential to diversify risk, especially in a down market. So let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts. What are we putting together to make this offering for your consideration? A Little bit about Grosvenor. Russell already gave you um, all the key points. These are just some distinguishing attributes that we'd ask you to keep in mind when you think about what we like to bring to clients and why we're partnering with Pangana for this. We talked about focusing on the mid-market. This is important. We're not talking large bio deals. We are talking companies that are typically less than a billion in enterprise value or fund managers who invest in companies and their funds are typically less than 1.5 billion. That is a much lower end of the market. We focus on bespoke solutions, separate accounts. Our clients are some of the world's largest and most sophisticated institutions around the world. They've entrusted us with their allocation, and we believe we're fully aligned with them. We are not in the market with a new fund every three to four years and then sit back. We are always in the market. That means at any point in time, we are fortunate to have capital that we can consider to invest with a manager, a company, or a secondary transaction. And you'll see exactly what that means for the opportunity set we get to evaluate for our clients. It also means that we have a pretty robust allocation process and that this particular solution with Pangana would sit side by side, pro rata, with some of our most sophisticated clients. We have focus in different specialized, specialized abilities. We're going to see about that in just a moment. And we have a global team. We think you have to have feet on the street. I said that private equity is private and that it's out of the spotlight of the street. There's another point about private equity being private. You can't look up information on a Bloomberg terminal. You can't read about it in the journal or in the FT. You can't Google about it. The only way you find out about private equity opportunities is by being in the market a long time fostering your networks, being the reliable source of capital, having pattern recognition, having deep relationships, having a proven track record, and being smart capital. There are three main areas in the portfolio that we're developing, but are the main areas in any portfolio we would create for an institution looking to have a first entry into private equity, if you will. They're called primary fund investing, secondary transactions, and co-investments. Now, primaries. This is where, ideally, we are finding the best of the best top quartile managers who manage a fund. We allocate money to them. They take that money, and over three to four years, they're identifying companies to invest in that are private. They're cultivating them. They're nurturing them. They realize them and exit them slowly, and they harvest them. That's a long process. When you go into one of these funds, it can be a 10 to a 14 year illiquid partnership. And it can be up to seven or eight years before you see a dime back on your investment. Those managers who are the best of the best are not readily available. And by the way, if they are readily available, you better have at least $10 million to go in for a minimum investment. These managers investing in companies you are trusting are going to do what they've done in the past deliver the same performance, stick to their knitting, have all of their team lined up for the next three to four years to execute on the same strategy, and are in full compliance. That's what we're doing as part of our qualification process. And this part of the market gives you forward-looking diversification. You cannot time the market in private equity. You need to have diversification by strategy, by manager. And these are the best that you're counting on to give you the forward next three years of the best investments, no matter what the market happens. Secondary investments are basically used private equity. We're purchasing a private equity fund holding or a pool of assets from an institution or a seller who just needs some liquidity. It's no reflection of the health of the asset. It is a reflection of the seller who needs liquidity. We purchase these, typically at a discount to net asset value, sometime at a premium. Our job is to do a bottom-up analysis company by company and forecast where that company is going to end up over the long term, and which the key value drivers are. Now, secondaries are already built out. You know the asset. It's not a blind pool. You can research it. You can diligence it. 
but they also give you backward diversification. So one investment in a secondary can have hundreds of companies going back to 15 years. And co-investments are the most concentrated investment you can make. Now I just said you can never time the market in private equity while well, you can time the market with co-investments. A co-investment is where you're investing in one company alongside one of the primary managers or manager that we know. We have a pure co-investment strategy. We're not going out there trying to find the next great Uber or any market disruptor and then bringing it to other managers and asking them to participate with us as investors. We have, invest we have managers bringing us portfolio companies that all are getting funded, that all have already been through vetting processes and qualified. We qualify them on our own and cherry pick the best of the best. When you make that investment, your dollar is in the ground day one. Your exposure is in the ground day one. They have a shorter hold, they realize faster, and they're meant to be an alpha kicker or a performance enhancer. Now all of these things work together in the ecosystem. More primary funds fuels more co-investments, fuels more secondary deals, fuels more exits, fuels more primary funds. It's quite a healthy little ecosystem when you're operating all. I said that manager selection on that primary part really matters. Well, you may have your top-down diversification by primary, secondaries, and co-investments, but private equity is all about the bottom up. It's about qualification and due diligence, investment and operational. And you can see here the long-term outperformance, North America and rest of world, 10 years, 15 years. Look at the difference between a bottom quartile performance and a top quartile performance. We've seen an excess of 1,000 basis points in some vintage years. This is where accessing the best of the best matters. Now that dark blue bar, that is what we seek to perform for our clients. Those are the managers with target performance that we are seeking to give our clients access to. Sounds too good to be true? There's risk. This is just some of them. You always have the risk that a portf portfolio company's financial health can collapse. It's always there. You can diversify it away by not having too much focus or concentration in that company. Illiquidity. How comfortable are you not having money for 14 years? Market risk. If you have all of your capital allocated in one year and that year is 2008, you might have a problem. Long-term horizon. Better be patient, because the realizations could come a decade from now. And the reliance on the manager, make sure you pick that right manager, because once you give them your money, you're trusting them to do what they said they were going to do. Now let me tell you a little bit about how we address those challenges and how we build a program. And then I'm gonna give it back to Russ, who's going to tell you why the offering that we've created actually addresses for the retail investor those risks I just listed. Investment philosophy, it's pretty simple at Grosvenor. Fewer, better. We think you should have fewer managers that are the best of the best and be patient. We have dedicated teams focused on primary investing, secondary investing, and co-investing. We think there's a very different set of skills and tools that are required to do each of those jobs well, which is why we have such a robust team with each of those specializations. You can't just wait around for the best manager to come ringing at your door. They're not gonna send you a letter and ask you to give them $10 million. In fact, you don't even know that they're in the market and they open in the morning and they close at night and it's done. We focus on being well ahead of the game in terms of the ask. We maintain a multi-year forward-looking calendar on when we think managers are coming to market. We leverage our extensive network and relationships in the industry. We leverage our pattern recognition in the industry. We use top-down diversification to mitigate and to eliminate some of that risk that I talked about. So you're not overexposed in one year, one geography, one strategy, in just primary, secondary, or directs. It must be balanced. We have access to information. We're in primary, secondaries, and directs. If you're making a co-investment, a direct co-investment, then if you have that company already over here in your primary portfolio, you're going to be able to evaluate it a lot better. And if you have a manager that you have three or four secondary positions in, you can evaluate their past track record a lot better to look at their future track record for a new fund. 
all of these tools come together to give information advantage. And information asymmetry in private equity is the key. Lastly, and this is important as well, we're one of the top allocators to emerging managers in the marketplace. Now, that does not mean first-time investors. That means new funds, typically formed by managers with 10, 20-year track records that are verifiable and testable. Frequently, we've tracked them and invested with them many, many years. They lift out, out of that shop. They hang up their own shingle with some partners and decide they want to own their destiny. They want to have the economics of their own work and their business going forward. It's a phenomenon we're seeing with a lot of generational shift with some of the larger firms. Some of the best of the best next gen talent, they want to be their own boss. We're typically the first call for those managers. We have significant support. We go in big when we see them, when we believe in them, and when we've done the research behind them. And that not only gives us the access to them, fund three, four, and five from now when they're not taking money from any new investors, but we're also the first call for a co-investment. And as a result, on our co-investments, over 60% of the time, we're the only other investor alongside, or the lead, as opposed to being one of eight. That's a very different negotiation discussion you're having when you're setting economic expectations and alignments. And we pass that on to our clients. How do we find the best of the best? We boil the ocean. We've seen almost 9,000 funds since 2000. Of those, about 40% actually get staffed with a diligence team after the first screen. And of those, they actually convert to about 8% being proven to receive capital from us on behalf of our clients. That's a lot of work, and it's global. On the right-hand side, what about companies? Well, 3,576 companies that were funded by other managers brought to us to participate in. Of those, a 10% conversion rate and only 7% actually get capital. Tight screen, right? On the co-investment side, for the last 10 years, we have seen on average a deal a day. And we've closed on a deal for the last eight years every two weeks on average. We like to tell a manager in two days whether we think we might have an indication of interest or no because a quick no is worth a lot more than a long maybe. And on the primary side, I would argue that the 92% we said no to is even more important than the 8% we said yes to, because that 92% are going to be the managers that are hanging up that shingle. And the way you say no, how constructive you are, how much you know about the market, makes a difference in your future access. And that's what we're bringing to our clients. Process, I'm not gonna take you through this, it's a whole bunch of boxes. This is our manager selection process and our approval process. There are two things you need to know. The dotted line on the bottom, we have an investment committee. Most firms have an investment committee. We have an operations committee too. Russell mentioned at the very beginning that we invest in all alternatives. Part of that is hedge funds. We've been able to take best practices cultivated in the hedge fund business going back three decades and bring them over to the private markets business. And this is something you will not see at every manager. We actually have taken ODD, operational due diligence protocols, and carried them over to private equity. We have a dedicated team of ODD professionals, our back office SWAT team, former SEC investigators, CIA trained interrogators, uh, cybersecurity experts, tax experts, legal experts. They are responsible for running their own due diligence on every opportunity that we consider at investment committee separate from the investment team, who is running their own evaluation on the investment merits, the market merits, the performance, the exit expectations that the manager has. A segregated process with two approval committees required, and every opportunity must be approved by both. We think that back office is just as dangerous as front office, and we're gonna do everything we can to mitigate that risk on behalf of our clients. We've done that a lot. You can get a sense here of just the number of funds, the number of years, the $28 billion of dollars that we've committed on behalf of clients that have entrusted us with their capital as their fiduciary. It's not just to say, great, we have a bunch of big numbers. It's to say, when you do it this long, you develop some Gnostic pattern recognition. You develop a database of deep information that you can mine and make smarter conclusions from. You have a process that is efficient, that is scalable and you're creating an apprenticeship type model to sustain that level of performance over the long term. How are we gonna deliver this to you? This is what the portfolio construction recommendation is at this point. 
This is it. You can see what the ranges are by each of the strategies. And at the end of the day, you're talking about 127 funds and over 600 companies. No one of those is going to move the needle in the portfolio. This is a very well diversified, risk averse program that is looking for straight down the fairway, consistent performance, not looking to swing for the fences and not looking to take on big downside risk. We've literally cut, cut off the ends on both sides. We talked about the forward vintage year diversification with primaries, the backward with secondaries, and the just in time with co's. Well, there are two other elements of diversification, geography and strategy. The geography side, we're focused on the most developed markets in private equity and the deepest pool of managers from which to select. That's North America and Western Europe for mid-market. And then we've got a 10% allocation opportunistic to rest of world. Australia would include rest of world. Strategies, mid-market buyout focus, no venture capital here, growth equity as I described earlier on, and special situations that distress for control. Those all have different forecasts and timelines associated with them. And when you bring all of these pieces together, that is how the nuts and bolts move the private equity program along. And this is how it develops. Year one, you can see the strategies to which we're allocating, and by year four is where we're at steady state. Now I told you about those primary fund managers, they're your real backbone of your portfolio. Those are the managers you're picking, you wanna be top quartile, and they're gonna give you that forward top performance over the long term. Well, when they do that forward performance, they don't need your money the day you make the commitment. So we have 57% of the capital in year one sitting in short duration credit, product, AAA, secure, four to 5%. We're not looking to make big yield on this. It's gonna have some associated with it, but we need that capital safely there so that when the managers call the capital, it's ready to go. And you can see the pacing of how quickly that gets called down. So that is a portfolio that is already committed to private equity. And then you can see the growth because your secondaries start throwing off cash, your co-investments start throwing off cash. And there's something special in year one also, at those participating with the IPO that Russell will take you through. So with that, hopefully you've learned a little bit about the six key facts you might want to consider if you're thinking about private equity, the different parts of diversification and why diversification is so important how Grosvenor does some of it, and how we're hoping to deliver it to our retail clients in Australia, along with Pangana. And remember those risks I told you, because Russell's about to tell you how we're addressing some of them with this structure. Thank you. Thanks, Aris. It's uh, always a pretty tough gig talking after you, uh, but I'll, I'll give it a go. So for all of you as investors, what is the issue about investing in private equity? Why don't you have private equity investments? Well, there's two major categories of impediments. The first one is access, and the second one is return profile. So when it comes to access, until today, until today you've never had an opportunity to access this broad range of investment opportunities, high quality investment opportunities in global private equity in a form that is very readily um, uh, usable. Uh, it's usually done when you invest in private equity, as Aris mentioned, uh, if you go into an individual fund, it's done on a drawdown basis. Now, most of us as investors don't like drawdowns. A drawdown means that a, the private equity firm will take your money steadily over three to four to five years. Um, if you want to make an investment in private equity, you want it to go in now and you want it to sit in your portfolio as a certain percent as part of your portfolio allocation. We've dealt with that by not having a drawdown. We will take all the money in on day one. Probably the biggest impediment to investing in private equity is the illiquidity. Now, if you go into a private equity fund, you need to be locked up for probably 13, 14, 15 years. It's going to take that amount of time to get all your money back. Most of us as investors do not like that illiquidity. We want to have our money if we need it. We have addressed this issue by listing the trust. So what we've done is effectively exactly the same as what the property trust industry figured out many years ago. And that is if you've got a very illiquid underlying asset class like property, how do you get it to investors in a form that is liquid, that where they can get in and out? Well, it's quite easy. You list the trust 
and investors can trade in and out of it, and that's how you get the, your liquidity. Our trust is no different to that, except instead of our underlying asset being property or infrastructure, our underlying asset is private equity. With regards to return profiles, private equity uh, usually um, has a poor return profile in the first couple of years, and this is particularly when it comes to primary investing. In our, um, in our, in our trust, we do not suffer that same issue, and the reason for that is because of the diversification of the portfolio across primaries, secondaries, and co-invest, which are strategies that will return uh, much quicker and will make money, should make money um, uh, from, from, from the beginning, combined with the amount of money that we're putting into the short duration credit on day one. We are also targeting a 4% uh, distribution yield. This is a listed investment trust, not a listed investment company. I think most of us in this room are across the issue of trust versus company and the potential uh, problems that might arise uh, if there's a future change in um, uh, uh, treatment of uh, franking credits. So trust is a better vehicle at this point uh, in, in time. And uh, there'll be a 4% distribution target, uh, and that is 2% paid every, um, uh, paid every uh, half year. We think that this uh, investment opportunity can sit in your portfolio as either a growth opportunity, because if you think about private equity returns, those are very strong, solid, um, uh, high growth returns. And likewise, it can sit in your portfolios as an, uh, as an income opportunity as well, because it does pay a 4% distribution yield. We are doing something in this transaction that is groundbreaking and has not been done before, and we think that this will A, contribute to a very successful uh, raising, but also really be appreciated by all of our investors. So firstly, um, and this is not new uh, to Pengana, we are paying the cost of the offer. These offers usually cost about 3% to get up and running. A few years ago, uh, trusts used to pay their own costs which was to the detriment of investors. And the investor, for instance, would put a dollar into an IPO. When it opened up on day one, there was only 97 cents of net asset value. The funds management industry a couple of years ago accepted that that was an unfair structure. And so the funds management industry now pays for the cost of the offer. So usually what will happen is you put your dollar into the IPO and when it opens up, the net asset value is a dollar. At Pengana, we are, do, we are flipping this whole paradigm and doing something absolutely groundbreaking, as I said. And what we're doing here is that when you put your dollar into the RPO and it opens up on day one, there is an estimated immediate uplift in net asset value of 5%. The net asset value will be about $1.05 on when it opens up, an immediate uptick. How are we doing that? We are taking some assets and we are putting them into the trust at what we call nominal value, basically you know, an irrelevant value uh, close to zero. We put, uh, we put it into the trust. Um, uh, those assets that we're putting into the trust are shares in Pengana Capital Group, our publicly listed uh, fund management company. So if we raise at the top end, end of the range $600 million, we will freshly issue 5% of 600, which is $30 million. We will freshly issue $30 million of PCG shares, Pengana Capital Group shares, that we will put into the trust. Therefore, the net asset value on the trust will be 5% above what investors have contributed. On a per, per unit basis, that will be a 5% uplift for, each of the unit, for, for every unit that you hold in the trust. So why are we doing this? A couple of reasons. Firstly, we want to really thank all our investors for having the faith in us and for investing into us in our, RP, in our RPO. It's great, it's great to have individual investors and we do really appreciate it. Secondly, PCG, Pengana Capital Group, will obviously do very well out of this transaction. We create a lot of value for shareholders in PCG. What we're doing, we're saying we're creating some value for PCG shareholders. Let's take some of that value and put it into, give it to investors in, in, in the trust. So we're sharing the value creation. We think it's a very fair thing to do. And finally, um, uh, it's very good for our brand, obviously, but we also want to have alignment with our shareholders. We love for our shareholders in PCG to be investors as well in our vehicles and vice versa. So we like that whole uh, scenario and we love aligning ourselves with our investors. So we have gone down, uh, down this route. 
Approximately two years after the listing, those shares will be sent out to investors. It's what we call an in-specie just distribution, basically like a dividend or a, 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 like a dividend distribution. Uh, but those shares will land up in your own hands as shareholders two years after listing. They do belong in the trust from day one. And so should you seek to sell your units after the IPO, you should be able to get value immediately. You don't need to wait two years. They, they're fully vested within the trust. So to sum it all, we are bringing uh, our investors an opportunity that's not, that hasn't been available in the marketplace before to invest, to invest in a large portfolio, highly diversified portfolio of global private equity in a listed form. This is simple to use and easy to access uh, through the IPO or in the, uh, or in the, sec or in the secondary uh, markets. It's managed by Grosvenor Capital, one of the preeminent private equity managers in the world. I'm going to leave it there. Um, oh, sorry, before I leave it there, uh, these are the details of, of the offer. The offer opened on, uh, on Monday, a few days ago, uh, and uh, the uh, priority offer and general offer will close on the 10th of April. The minimum issue size uh, for the trust is $100 million, and we have capped it at $600 million. Um, our fees for, this, for the structure are 1.25% management fee and a 20% performance fee only over and above an 8% uh, return uh, to, uh, to investors.